Hey everyone, today I'm going to show you how my DIY battery was able to triple the range of my daughter's electric wheelchair. I'll cover the design, build, and install of the battery, and then I'll open it up after two years of use to see how it looks as I move it into her new wheelchair. My name is Dave and I am another nerdy Canuck. My daughter, Jessica, has been using a Quantum Edge 2 eye-level wheelchair for the past four years. Although we love the chair and how it improves her life, its most significant drawback is the relatively short range. Jessica loves to get out and drive into town. For her, a typical trip into town and back is about 8 kilometers or 5 miles. Even with a brand new set of the recommended AGM style batteries, a trip like that will use up 50% of her battery capacity. Part of the problem is that we live on a hill at the edge of town. Now the owner's manual suggests that we, uh, you know, plan your trip in advance to avoid inclines, but there's no way for her to avoid the 30 meter or about 100 foot change in elevation between our house and downtown. The way back up is all uphill and it was not uncommon for her to receive under voltage warnings on the way home. This 50% depth of discharge is the maximum recommended level for lead acid batteries. And that doesn't leave any range for the whole rest of her daily activities. This makes her real world driving range about eight kilometers on a single charge. And that is with brand new batteries. As the batteries age, the capacity reduces significantly. If we look at the cycle life chart, for lead acid batteries, daily charging at 50% depth of discharge is going to degrade her range down to 60% in less than two years. With older batteries, it is not uncommon that her chair would just stop functioning on the way home and we would need to go pick her up with our wheelchair van. Even though we worked with our local medical supply company and their amazing technicians to try and solve this problem, there didn't seem to be any way around this battery limitation. With the extensive use of lithium-based batteries to power cars and lawn care equipment, we tried to find a lithium-based wheelchair battery, but no one seems to make them. Apparently, the scooter and wheelchair industry has not seen a need to adopt the new battery chemistries that are available. Sorry, rant finished. Anyway, since we couldn't purchase them, I decided to try and build one on my own. After some research, I decided that lithium iron phosphate or LFP batteries would be the best choice. They have a much better energy density and can support a greater depth of discharge. Check out the cycle life of an LFP battery compared to the AGM we looked at earlier. If we estimate a daily discharge of 50%, after one and a half years or just over 500 daily charges, you can see the AGM style batteries are down to 60% of their original capacity, but the LFP batteries are still at 97%. This will make a huge difference on how far my daughter can drive, especially after the batteries have aged a bit. The other major benefit of the LFP batteries is the ability to discharge down to 20% capacity without damaging them. I did avoid the lithium ion or ternary style battery. Those are the ones that are prone to thermal runaway and a fire risk. The lithium iron phosphate batteries are much safer. The only real disadvantage of lithium iron phosphate batteries is the initial purchase price. However, because they last so long, they're actually cheaper in the long run. The recommended batteries for my daughter's Edge 2 wheelchair are two 50 amp hour NF22 batteries that are connected in series to create a 24 volt battery. Using the recommended discharge of only 50%, this leaves about 25 amp hours of usable capacity. At the normal operating voltage, this is about 600 watt hours of available energy. My plan is to build a battery from eight 105 amp hour 3.2 lithium iron phosphate batteries connected in series to create a 25.6 volt battery. If we allow for 80% discharge, this 84 amp hours of available energy at 25 volts works out to 2,100 watt hours of energy. This is over three and a half more times usable energy per charge than the recommended batteries. This almost seems too good to be true, but I can confirm that these batteries are actually able to do that. Jessica is able to travel over 30 real world kilometers or about 19 miles on a charge. This has been so liberating for her. I have to admit, I'm a little bit frustrated that the industry has not embraced this technology yet. Another important part of the switchover is to get a charger that is designed for LFP batteries. The onboard chair charging connection is only rated for eight amps. So I purchased an LFP battery charger with an eight amp charge current rating and the XLR connector used on her chair. This keeps the functionality of the wheelchair the same for my daughter. One of the downsides of this battery replacement is the built-in battery indicator in the chair controller is voltage-based. The LFP battery operates at a slightly higher voltage than this indicator was designed for. 
Also, the LFP discharge curve does not work well with a voltage-based indicator. The voltage remains relatively unchanged during the majority of the discharge, as you can see here. I will add a proper capacity meter on the battery. This will be less visible to my daughter when operating the chair, but we have actually found out that the available range being so large, this hasn't actually been a problem. To monitor and protect the individual LFP cells, I will use a battery management system or BMS. This is necessary to ensure that no cells are damaged by overcharging or draining too low. It will also allow me to monitor the health of the cells over the years. One final design element, I will add a USB phone charging plug so that she can ensure her cell phone is always charged if she is out and about and her phone battery gets low. For this, I purchased an inexpensive 24 volt to 5 volt DC converter. Once I receive the cells, I top balance them to 100% or 3.65 volts. This is an important step to ensure that all of the cells start at the same charge level. Since they should all charge and discharge at about the same rate, this should keep them all at about the same state of charge. I initially started by balancing all of them in parallel, but this was taking way too long. To speed things up, I temporarily connected them in series and regularly monitored the voltage of each cell. Once the highest voltage started to get close to 3.5 volts, I reconnected them in parallel to finish the top balancing. This whole process took about a week. I built a battery box out of 4.5 millimeter or 316 inch acrylic to protect the cells and the electronics from the weather. I measured the internal space available in the chair for batteries to make the box as large as I could. This would give me maximum volume to work with and minimize how much sliding around the assembled battery case could do. It is essentially the size of the pair of recommended batteries and just a bit taller. I used my table saw to cut all the various pieces and then sanded the edges smooth. This is important as I am using a solvent to weld the pieces together. I used some painter's tape to hold the box together and used a small dispenser for the solvent. It quickly ran into the spaces between the pieces and created a structural and waterproof connection. Since the box is mostly hidden, I didn't really make any effort to make it aesthetically pleasing. Once the box was complete, I test fit the cells to locate some dead space. This space is where the battery management system will go, and I drilled two holes, one for the 70 amp circuit breaker and the other one for the battery level monitor. After test fitting the breaker and battery monitor, it was time to start packing the case and wiring the components together. For this style of battery cells, the outside metallic case is electronically connected with one of the terminals. The thin blue wrap isn't a robust insulator and wouldn't survive the potential rubbing and vibration of a moving chair. I used a thin sheet of 0.03 inch styrene plastic between the cells to keep them electrically isolated. I marked out an appropriate size on the plastic and cut them out with some scissors. I then taped the cells together with thermal tape in two sets of four and then placed them in the acrylic box. I also added a styrene divider where the ends of my cells could possibly rub. After test fitting, I noticed it was almost a snug fit, so I grabbed a thin sheet of some soft packing foam to ensure that it would be nice and tight so that the cells would be very unlikely to move. I located where the wires for connecting the chair would leave the battery and drilled some holes for the wires to exit from. I then added a notch at the top for the USB port and the BMS Bluetooth dongle. Originally, I was going to use the bus bars that came with my cells to connect them. However, I thought it might extend the life of the battery to use a more flexible option connecting the cells to prevent putting any strain on the terminals. I made all of the jumpers by crimping terminals on the ends of some 4 gauge wire with a hammer crimper. I tried to do one for the video camera on my work table, but I couldn't strike it hard enough to actually set the crimp. For all of my crimps, I used my hammer crimper set on the basement concrete floor, and I did all the crimps for this project off camera. However, here's a clip of a hammer crimp made during the install of my DIY home battery backup. The video for my DIY home battery backup has not been made yet, so make sure you like this video and subscribe to my channel so you get notified when it is uploaded. As I placed all the connectors, I included the BMS system connections at the positive terminals of each cell. Once they were all tightened in place, I connected the BMS wire to the negative terminal and plugged in the terminal connectors. After verifying voltage on the BMS to ensure it was working, I added the shunt for the battery monitor and the 70 amp breaker. I did end up making a small extension cable for the BMS wire. The included wire was just a bit short to work with and it made connecting the shunt a bit easier. As I neared the end, I added the Anderson connector wires exiting the battery to plug into the chair connector. These wires were a six gauge stranded battery wire. This was the same size wire the manufacturer had used, so I figured it should be good. 
I protected the wire with some of the same braided cable sleeve used by the manufacturer. Once I had wired it to the shunt, I crimped on the Anderson SP50 terminals and placed and installed the Anderson connector. To ensure I could swap out the battery as quickly as possible, I did purchase a spare wiring harness for the chair. This was not necessary, but gave me some peace of mind that I could switch out as quickly as possible. Also, if the swap went badly, I could just reconnect the original wiring and battery so my daughter could stay mobile. Fortunately, everything went well, and this precaution was not needed. To convert the chair connection wiring harness to fit my 24 volt battery, I simply needed to adjust the Anderson SP50 connectors. I love the Anderson style connectors because they are relatively easy to disconnect the terminals from the connectors. I just moved the positive and negative terminals coming from the proprietary chair connector to a single Anderson connector. After mounting the battery monitor, I connected it to the shunt and everything seemed to be working. I set the amp hour capacity as per the instructions, and since the batteries had all been top balanced and were full, I set the battery monitor to read 100%. The battery monitor was already set to the 105 amp hour capacity of my battery cells. I did this during a test I ran during the initial setup to make sure everything was working before I packed the cells into the case. Once the wires were all packed into the remaining space, I just needed to add the lid. The whole battery is pretty well protected by the chair structure, so for the lid I just took a flat piece of plastic and welded a small piece on all four sides to keep it centered. I did drill and add a couple of screws to hold it firmly in place. With that, the battery build was complete and it was time for the install. Of course, when it was ready to install, it was late in the evening and my daughter had already changed into her PJs, but bless her heart, she agreed to be videoed for the switch out and a quick test. This is my daughter, Jessica. Hello. All right, so if you want to go up. I had her use the eye level feature to race herself up out of the way, and then I took off the front cover of the battery compartment. I disconnected and removed the OEM batteries, but left the original wiring harness in place just in case it didn't go as planned. I unplugged the original wire harness and plugged in my modified chair connection cable and connected the new battery. Jessica powered up her chair and everything seemed good, so I attempted to slide the battery box in place. After a few attempts, I realized the corner pieces of the lid were bumping into the frame, so I had to shave them down a bit, but after that was able to slide the new battery snugly into place. I put the chair battery cover on and it was time for a quick test. She took it outside in the dark and drove it around just a little bit, and everything worked great. The real test came the next day. She took her chair downtown and back and used so little battery we were all shocked. We have found that she can go about 30 real world kilometers on a charge. This is great because now she never worries about her chair limitations and going downtown and sometimes even goes twice in a day. She doesn't even charge her chair every night. It is really rewarding to see her live her life without having to even think about running out of a battery. All of the footage up to this point is from more than two years ago. It is hard to believe it has taken me this long to get this video out. Anyway, I am happy to report that this battery is still working just as well today as the day I made it. I have not touched it since it was originally installed. If I log on to the Bluetooth BMS, we can see that there has only been 260 charge cycles so far. At this charging frequency, this battery could last 30 years. You can see on the screen captures taken at two different states of charge. One when the battery was at 52%, the other at 100%. I'm not sure why the BMS amp hour capacity is so far off, but the voltages seem a bit out of whack at the upper end with a fairly significant voltage discrepancy. At some point, I will probably either add an active balancer to the cells or replace the BMS with one that has a built-in active balance feature. That way they are continuously top balanced when we are charging the batteries. I will keep an eye on it, but I don't see any need at this point. The battery capacity is still way more than required for daily use. If you see any concerns or have some suggestions, please let me know in the comments below. I'd really appreciate it. Well, her Edge 2.0 wheelchair provided service for over six and a half total years, so we have just replaced it with a new Edge 3.0 chair. Since the battery still has decades of use left in it, I'm just going to move it over to the new chair. Just out of curiosity, when she took delivery of her new chair, she took a trip to town to see how it would do. After an eight and a half kilometer round trip, the new included batteries were down by 50%, and she was super eager to have the LFB battery moved over to her new chair. The transfer over was pretty straightforward. I took off the old chair battery cover, disconnected the battery and removed it. I thought it would be good to open it up to see if the weather had had any impact on it in the past two years. But as you can see, it looks the same as it did as when I first built it. In her new chair, I disconnected the included batteries and slid them out. 
I unplugged and disconnected the original wiring and plugged in my modified chair connection wire. The space in this new model of chair is just a bit narrower than the previous one, so when sliding my battery in, the rubber cover on the circuit breaker did pop off. I connected the battery to the chair, and after confirming it was working, I reinstalled the battery cover. The new chair has been working great, and the battery is still going strong. I will probably do another update video in a couple of years, or if I decide to add an active balancer. Working with any form of high capacity battery can be dangerous, but if you are a competent do-it-yourselfer, this is a project that can really impact someone's independence. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. Please click on the like and subscribe buttons to make sure more people see this video. If you want to be notified when a new video comes out, please make sure to click on the notification bell. Thanks again for watching. This has been a life-changing experience for my daughter. I'm glad you came along for the ride. Cheers.